In many opinions, superconducting qubits are today's top contender to make a fully functional quantum computer. But have you ever wondered how they really work? Superconducting qubits are pretty complicated devices, so we're going to need to break this down into parts. This video will focus primarily on the theory of how these devices work. I will do future videos on how to make them in the lab, so stay tuned for that. So, if we want to understand superconducting qubits, the first thing that we have to understand is a ball on a spring. No, seriously, I'm, I'm not kidding. Just, just bear with me here. So if we look at a ball on a spring, we notice something very quickly about the motion. The ball moves back and forth on the spring in a nice repeatable pattern at a specific frequency. The motion is periodic. If we trace out the motion of this ball on the spring, it turns out to be fully described by a single equation. Here, omega is the frequency of the oscillation, and a is the amplitude. This motion, described by this equation, is called simple harmonic motion, and it's found all over physics. It turns out that the simple harmonic oscillator is very important to superconducting qubits. So, the mass on the spring is one of the simplest examples of simple harmonic oscillator physics, which is why I used it to introduce the concept. But it seems pretty far removed from quantum computing. So, let's take a small step closer to quantum computers. If we take this small step, we arrive at the LC circuit. The LC circuit is a simple harmonic oscillator, just like the mass on the spring. Except here, instead of a mass oscillating, we have charges oscillating. In this circuit diagram, L is an inductor, a circuit element that resists changes to current flow by producing magnetic fields, and C is a capacitor, two parallel plates connected by a wire which can store electrical energy in the form of charges building up on one of the plates. Now, if we go back to the LC oscillator, if we write down the equation for current as a function of time, we can see the same characteristic equation of simple harmonic motion that we saw before. Okay, so far I've talked about two different types of harmonic oscillators that seem completely different from one another. But you may be wondering whether something deeper is going on here. The thing tying the harmonic oscillators together is actually their potential energy. Potential energy is the energy stored by a system. For a mass on a spring, the potential energy is maximized when the spring is all the way compressed. Generally, a simple harmonic oscillator is a physical system with the following potential energy. Here, Q is some generalized coordinate. It could be position, charge, or any other parameter that we use to describe our system. If we want to then go from the harmonic potential to an equation of motion, we can use what's known as the Hamiltonian. Some of you may have done this another way, by balancing forces in your physics class in high school or college. This is using Newton's laws, but today I'm going to use the Hamiltonian because it's what translates most directly and naturally to quantum computers. Anyways, the Hamiltonian is just the sum of the potential and kinetic energy of a system. If we solve Hamilton's equations, which are differential equations that use the Hamiltonian, it allows us to solve for the motion of the simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, so I've spent the last few minutes trying to convince you that the simple harmonic oscillators are really cool and that you should care more about this weird esoteric mathematical construct called the Hamiltonian than our good old buddy Newton's laws. Why? Well, now you'll see. Up until this point, everything that we've talked about is classical physics. No quantum mechanics has been going on. So now, let's go to quantum mechanics. We can still describe a quantum mechanical system by a Hamiltonian, just like a classical system. This is why I wanted to use Hamiltonians before. But now, there are some mathematical differences. I'm not going to go super in-depth on these differences, but I'll list them here so that you know that they exist. First, the Hamiltonian is now an operator. An operator operates on functions, and the Hamiltonian operates on the wave function of our system. The wave function just tells us about the probability that our system is in a specific state. You can think of an operator as a series of mathematical operations that are performed on a function. Second, instead of solving Hamilton's equations, we now solve the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is also a differential equation, except now we're solving for energy states as opposed to particle motions. So they're pretty different in the actual mechanics of solving them. In quantum mechanics, our goal is to use the Schrodinger equation to solve for the allowed energies in a system. Remember that in quantum systems, not all energies are allowed, so only a specific subset of energies can be occupied. If our goal is to make a superconducting quantum computer, and it is, 
then we need to start with a single qubit. And if we want to make a single qubit, we need to start by designing a physical system that has a Hamiltonian such that its allowed energies are useful for quantum computation. What this means is that you must have two individually addressable states, meaning we need to have a state that we can call zero and a state that we can call one. Okay, that was a lot, so let's just see how it actually works. Let's start with a quantum LC oscillator, the same type of oscillating circuit that I showed you before, only now it's quantum. The way we make it quantum is by making the circuit out of superconductors instead of regular conductors. Since superconductors arise from quantum mechanics, the behavior of the conglomerate of electrons that actually cause superconductivity is described by quantum mechanics, and you can't describe it classically. So this actually works and translates directly into quantum mechanics. Okay, so we have a quantum LC oscillator. Now, if we solve the system, we get the following result. Some of you may be seeing a problem here. We wanna make qubits, right? And in qubits, you want to have two isolated energy levels. But if you have a harmonic oscillator with a ladder of states like this, then you'll never be able to isolate two energy states. Since when you try and go from one to zero, you may also go from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 all the way up the ladder. This is because the frequency or the energy difference between 1 and 0 is the exact same as the frequency or energy difference between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, and again all the way up the ladder. When you try and do what's called stimulated emission, where you move from 1 to 0 by shining the transition frequency, you're also shining the transition frequency that would be between 1 and 2, and therefore you end up going from 1 to 2 half the time and 1 to 0 half the time. Well, that's why we don't use perfectly harmonic oscillators for our qubits. Harmonic oscillators are actually used as resonators, which we use to talk to qubits. Specifically, we use resonators for readout, meaning we use resonators to tell what state our qubit's in. To make qubits, we modify the harmonic oscillator slightly. More specifically, if we go to our harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian and change our inductive term to something nonlinear, but that looks like a harmonic oscillator near the bottom, we can add anharmonicity into the Hamiltonian. This causes the ladder rungs to separate, and the distance between each energy level will now no longer be the same. We can do this by changing the type of inductor we use, from a normal inductor to a Josephson junction. Josephson junctions are circuit elements which behave like inductors except they're nonlinear. This means that they don't create a perfect harmonic oscillator, and it only looks like one at low energy. We can then pick the two lowest energy states, call those 0 and 1, and use that for computation. The frequencies in the higher states are now different from the frequency between 0 and 1, and so we have individually addressable states that we can call a qubit. The most common form of this qubit right now is a transmon qubit. This is what IBM uses, for example, but many others exist. All right. So how do we build an actual quantum computer? Let's just start with a single qubit. Well, we need four components. First, we need a drive line. This lets us send electrical signals directly to our qubits. Two, we need the qubit itself. Three, we need a resonator. This will talk to our qubit and couple to it so that we can read the state of our qubits out. And four, a transmission line. This is what we actually connect wires to, and it will couple to our resonator and let us actually measure the state of our resonator and by proxy the qubit. Now, let's go through a direct example to make things more clear. So let's assume we already prepared our qubit so that it's in the zero state. Let's try to apply a not gate, meaning flipping a zero to a one. To do this, first we apply an electrical pulse to the transmission line to measure the resonant frequency of our resonator. We do this as a benchmark before we do any operations on our qubit, as it'll serve as a point of comparison later. Next, we apply an electrical pulse at the resonant frequency of the qubit to the qubit's drive line. The resonant frequency is just the frequency difference between the zero and the one states. Then, to read out our qubits, we send electrical pulses through the transmission line and measure the frequency of our resonator again. If the gate worked, then the frequency of our resonator should be different than it was before we applied the gate, because the new qubit state coupled to the resonator, shifting its energies. This coupling is known as capacitive coupling, and it happens when you have two circuit elements close together on a chip. The reason for the coupling is that the charges in one region of the chip repel the charges in another region of the chip, and so they interact. Changing the quantum state of the system changes the ways the electrons move, and therefore different quantum states in our qubit 
have different effects on the resonator and change the frequency. All right, so we just went through a single measurement, i.e. a single bit flip on a quantum computer. It's important to note that in this video I haven't mentioned superposition or entanglement, since the point of the video was just to show how I can make a qubit. That being said, if you've heard about these things and want to learn how superposition and entanglement work in superconducting quantum computers, stay tuned, because I'll be doing a video on that soon. If you found this video interesting or helpful, please don't forget to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel. This is the first of a series of videos on superconducting qubits, so if you're interested in learning all about them, from the theory all the way down to how you actually make them in the lab, then please stay tuned for more, because I'm going to be covering each one of these facets of superconducting qubits in detail. Until next time, I've been Lucas, and this has been Lucas's Lab. Thanks for watching.